for those of you who don't know me, I'm Eric. Hi, thanks. Uh, usually you see me as a blur somewhere between here and there, and uh, for those of you watching on my YouTube channel, this is a change of scenery. Uh, this is a church I go to on a regular basis, Trinity United. And so uh, today I'm going to be speaking about the theme of transformation, transfiguration. It is Transfiguration Sunday, uh, and there's many different kinds of transformation that one can undergo. It could be uh, small in scope as just a personal transformation, or it could be your community, it could be the world around you, it could be your entire society might be uh, transforming at the same time. There's also transformations that happen, inner transformations, ones that you might not even be able to see. Uh, your knowledge might transform, your awareness of the world around you, your perspective, your, the way you're looking at things. Or it could be an outer transformation. It could involve the material conditions of your life or the material conditions of the, the world around you, the way you live might transform. These transformations could be slow or they could be sudden. They could be for better or they could be for worse. There's sometimes intentional transformations, ones that you try and bring on yourself, or sometimes they're just completely unexpected, something you can't control, something that's unpredictable in nature. Well, and today's story from the Bible involves transformation. Jesus and his three friends go up the mountain. They're going to hang out, they're going to have some quality time together, and, well, they're probably also going for a spiritual retreat as well. They're looking to get away from it all so that they can think clearly and, and get a real sense for how they feel and, and where they are in the world. And for many faiths, mountains are holy places. The higher up you go, the spirit world boundary, the boundary to the spirit world gets thinner up there. And so it's a great place for looking out. You can see very far from the top of a mountain and you can gain some clarity as you're, you're doing this overlook over the rest of the world that you're usually in. So Jesus and his buds are up there and they're, they're hanging out, they're, uh, they're having a great time, when all of a sudden they get this funny feeling, just this strange sense comes upon them. A presence is there, an energy, a, a flash of light and color all of a sudden. Jesus, all of a sudden, they, they look up, he's glowing. He's full of the Spirit. He's a bright, shining white. And he's talking with two spirits. And they recognize them as Moses and Elijah. These are prophets. Moses being one of the Old, Te Old Testament prophets who saw a burning bush and was inspired by this encounter with the burning bush to go back to Egypt and rescue his fellow Israelites from Egypt out of slavery. And then also was the giver of laws, the Ten Commandments. He's the one that gave structure to the people of Israel so that they could live an effective society. Elijah, meanwhile, is, well, he's the prototypical Jesus, the Jesus of the Old Testament who spoke truths and cast out demons and, and um, basically was the, the great prophet of the Jewish people. And now, well, Jesus is among them. He's standing with them. He's speaking with them. They've accepted the, him as one of their own. And there's magic in the air. Well, and, and Peter, Peter, he's, he's taken aback by this. He's surprised by this. And so he, he whips out his phone. He, he tries to take a picture of this. He tries to capture the moment by building three monuments to, to this event, one for each of the people standing there. But, but you can't capture lightning in a bottle. It's not possible. You can't grasp onto these moments. The experience is ineffable. It's undescribable almost. So well, while he's trying to do this, well, God shows up, and, and God's like, this is my child whom I love and adore. Trust in his wisdom. And, well, Peter's gobsmacked by this. His, his friends, Jesus' friends are just gobsmacked. They're, they start freaking out. They're, like, groveling on the ground. They're... they're having trouble making sense of their senses, they're clearly thinking that they've gone mad. But Jesus, he keeps a cool head. He, he knows everything's okay. So he, he goes to his friends and he calms them down, chills them out, and they eventually get up. And he talks them down and they look out and they're alone now. All they have now is themselves and Jesus. Now, the story in the Bible is pretty short. It's not, it's only just one chapter. But I imagine that this adventure continued past this point. They likely continued wandering through the mountain, uh, learning and exploring different places and having more revelations, maybe realizing more things than they did before. And Jesus is 
speaking things and, and sharing his wisdom and probably just blowing their minds in this process. And they all come back transformed. They're never really different from the way they were before. They have had, they've experienced the end of an era. They've experienced the beginning of a new era. They're filled with confidence now. They, all that doubt that they had and the fear that they had before this, well, it's just melted away. They're now confident and carrying the truth of a new and better world that's to come. Now, I've had a similar experience to this, a life-altering transformation, a moment where I can measure my life in two periods, the time before this moment and the time after this moment, after which nothing is ever the same. And I've told this story before in part in this place, but it bears repeating because it's so important. Now, in my youth, I was um, not a pleasant person. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was very isolated. Uh, I was one of those, like, awful anti-theist atheists that would have no use for a church and would think that anybody, anybody that believes in a god or anything like that, ah, oh, they're just crazy. They're just stupid. They don't know better. And so I was full of depression and anxiety and loneliness and just a general hatred for the world because it wasn't going my way. It wasn't conforming to the way that I wanted the world to be. But all this changed on a, a one August night about 15 years ago now when a close friend and I, well, we had a magical experience. We shared a pizza with some <clears throat> mushrooms on it and then we went on an adventure. We went wandering around the neighborhood around here and we found ourselves in Kiwanis Park just across the street here. And it was just the perfect night, the perfect temperature, just warm enough that you can be out in shorts and a t-shirt, which obviously I love, uh, just enough humidity that you know, your skin is nice and soft, and the, the stars were just so clear and so many, and there was this beautiful, perfect full moon up there. Just the first early crickets out there, still air. And I laid down on the soft grass under the base of an ancient willow tree, and I, I looked up, and just looking up over this amazing sea of stars and gazing into the moon, and I realized suddenly, like the disciples, I was having an experience of magic. Now, the noise in my head, it, it fell silent, just suddenly, like, like this anxiety that I'd always felt was gone, all of a sudden. I was startled by it, and I was filled by the sense of overwhelming peace and love and joy and calm. It was just, it was incredible. The moon felt like it was close, like I could reach out and grab it, that everything was, was near to everything else. And, some, and, um, and distance between things just vanished as I gazed up. And as I felt the grass beneath me and I felt the tree behind me, I felt the air around me and my friend beside me, and I was just overcome by the sensation of awe and oneness, unity. I was no longer alone, no longer separate and independent. I was part of something, part of everything, an intimately interconnected part of an overarching whole. The entire universe was one and a part of me. I'm both utterly insignificant and also the vitally important center of the universe. I was having a realization here. I was experiencing God. All those stories I'd been told about experiencing God, having an experience of God, this was it. This was happening to me right now. And as I gazed around, well, the world was now just suffused with, with meaning. There's, there's purpose and value, and the heavens and the earth just danced with life a shining fabric of electric energy and shimmering color. I cannot adequately describe what was going on. It was just incredible. But I imagine it was probably like what the disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself were experiencing up on the mountain. Now, of course, you can't live up on the mountaintop. You can't just stay there. And I, as with Peter, well, you can't smuggle that magic back down either. You can't take a picture of it and have that with you. But you can be permanently changed by the experience, and I was. And that sense of awe and love and the knowledge of the, the unity and the Spirit of God, the feeling of that in and with me, 
well, that's permanent. I'm never the same as I was before. And in that moment, I found direction, a sense of purpose. Uh, it's, it's still unclear, and it's still evolving, but, but this experience provided some clues that put me in the right direction. I came to the experience of spirituality this way, started living for other people, started living for community, and indeed, I ended up here at Trinity. It's one of the, the key moments of my life. And this experience provided the, the start of the process of personal transformation, which continues to this day and will forever. But how? How did this happen and why? Well, I still self-describe as an atheist. I, the God I saw doesn't talk, it doesn't have a will, it doesn't want things of me. It's more like a property of the world itself, more like something that's natural, something that's identical to the universe, something similar to what the philosopher Baruch Spinoza would uh, vision, envision God as, where God is the same as everything. Rationally, I knew all this was happening in my mind. It was just a property of my brain. But it's still definitely happening, it's still something I'm definitely experiencing. So what's going on there? I could still remember the sensation, and the world definitely looked different from that point onward. So how did this happen to me? Well, so fascinated by this phenomenon that I started studying it. I started learning all there is to know about this mystical experience phenomenon. And it turns out it's everywhere, absolutely everywhere, across cultures, across uh, races and genders and faith groups. It's the same experience of peace and love and unity and awe and the sense that you're part of something greater than yourself. So it's, it turns out that there's many different ways that this can happen. I've actually felt similarly in different times. When I was at a, a really great concert, I suddenly felt this unity with the room that I was part of everything. Also, times when I was part of a team, when I was part of a really great team that was working well together, we were able to just collaborate, and it was like being part of them. Also, on stage at a murder mystery, I've felt this very experience while I was acting that I was just so in the moment, so in this experience, that the walls between me and the rest of the room and the rest of the world just disappeared. Now, young children, they, they live in this state on a regular basis. Most children under the age of three, they don't even have an experience of the world being separate from themselves. And so this is just how they live. This, and indeed, what I was experiencing, it felt like childhood. This sense of wonder, this feeling of being home, but also there's other ways, various different kinds of ritual, meditation, prayer, rhythmic breathing, dancing, chanting, that sort of thing. All these sorts of things can bring on this sensation of being like in the moment, part of the universe. And yes, various indigenous plant medicines also can bring this on. And all sorts of ceremonies that have been practiced throughout the ages. For as long as there's been human culture, there's been civilizations that have used these sorts of practices. In fact, it's built right into the human brain. It's part of us, this capacity for the spiritual experience. It's a natural function of being a human being. Now, some people might feel like thinking of it this way as something that the brain does. Some people might think that this cheapens the experience, that, that robs it of its magic, but I don't think so. I think this, is, this makes it all the more important. It means that we humans, we're magical beings by nature. We are magic ourselves. And my experience was not unique. Everybody has access to this to one degree or another. All one needs to do is just call that forth, whether it to be take one of these uh, spirit medicines or to do one of these ritual dances or do the rhythmic breathing, meditation, prayer, do whatever it needs to be. You can bring it on yourselves to call it forth, to invite the spirit, to invoke the magic, to go up the mountain. This, but why is this important? The reason is because it discovers what's hidden. It helps us see the world differently. It helps to change the narrative of our lives. Now, the stories that we hear, the stories that we're exposed to on a regular basis, well, they create a different kind of reality. The dominant narrative of our age is, well, it makes the people like I used to be anxious and frustrated and alone and hopeless and, well, judgmental. Through the news, through political pundits, through pop culture, through the common sense that we're 
usually told, we're told that we should be independent, self-sufficient, in competition with one another, valued purely by our, by our net worth, and of course, never, ever good enough, and responsible for our own misfortune, that everybody's just out for their own best interest, their own self-interest. So selfishness is actually virtue in this worldview. And this toxic narrative, well, it, it creates a delusional experience of the world, of isolation and of independence. It creates a, a hostile world that you're the center of. It's not very fun to be in. But instead, the, the experience of magic shows how absurdly wrong this is. It reveals the truth that we're actually interdependent people, that we're inherently worthy, and that we're stronger together in cooperation. And it reminds you that you're part of something. You're not alone, that things matter, that it can get better that we're not stuck with things just the way they are because that's the way they are. If we wanted to, things could be different, and we can make that so. If more people recognized this, if more people had these realizations that the world would be different. But mostly, we're denied this experience. The very few people have even ever had such an experience. The hyper-rational age that we currently live in just denies the value of any such magic. We're labeled as being irrational, as being part of a fantasy, that we're hallucinating, that this is just crazy talk. You're just, you're just out of your mind. Even some churches do oppose the idea of the spiritual experience. Or those that do use it, well, they claim exclusive access to spirituality, that if you're not doing it right, well, you're full of Satan or whatever, which clearly is not the case. They spin these narratives to exclude people that, they, that don't serve their agenda. And it's like taking God's name in vain. They're basically saying what God is telling you, but God's not really telling them that. They're just talking and using God's name to justify themselves. They're just a bunch of charlatans and hypocrites. Then the colonial history of, the, of our Western society. Well, all these indigenous spiritualities that experience this magic, they're all outlawed. The plant medicines are made illegal. The ritual traditions are lost to history, mostly. But the good news is this is changing. We're starting to transform to a different world now. And there's a growing body of research that shows the benefit of the spiritual experience on all these plant medicines, the psychiatric treatments that involve uh, these narrative therapies are providing healing for people that otherwise couldn't find any help. And social science is making it very clear. It's establishing the links between socioeconomic status and trauma and mental health outcome and making it clear that the world needs to be better, that it could be better. And even though the illusion is strong, there's this undercurrent of awareness, just a faint inkling at now, a gut sensation that this is not real, that there's a different world that is possible. And recognition and awareness is the start of the path to this transformation. By rejecting the fake world of competition and isolation, and then embracing the truth of interdependence and cooperation and compassion and care for the generalized other, now, these, these revelations, they're not always pleasant. Recognizing delusions that you hold, well, that's, that's uncomfortable. Experiencing things differently is disorienting and uncomfortable and confusing at times. And some truths are hard to accept, which is why they're so deeply hidden in the first place. But you need to trust it. You need to trust the transformation. Let the spirit of humanity guide you and inhabit you and show you, transform you. Become as Jesus. Follow the wisdom that's laid before you. Be transfigured on the mountaintop as a child of God. First you, and then spread that transformation to others around you, and then to your community, and then the world at large. We need to advocate as well for the politics to match this philosophy, policies that help those who need it, to ensure that everyone's got enough, to get those with power to share, 
to build better worlds for everyone instead of just accumulating wealth to themselves, to seize back power from the economy and make it work for us rather than us working for it, to acknowledge the importance of the environment and do everything possible to fix this mess that we've made. So, my friends, let's head up the mountain together. Let's go on a magical adventure, a journey to find truth. It doesn't really matter what path you take or how it is that you're traveling because they all go the same direction. The destination isn't actually even the aim. It's traveling the path that matters. And of course, you're, you're not traveling alone. There's all others of goodwill are joining you on this journey, regardless of race or religion or creed or doctrine or anything else that seems to divide us, it does not. We often say around here that we prefer kind atheists over mean Christians, and we absolutely mean it. We all have our different paths, and we all screw up sometimes, of course, but it's the intention to kindness that matters. That's the only measure of worth. Your intent begets your transformation, and your commitment to truth becomes your guide, whatever comes your way. And so, remember, the Spirit is with you, as it was with Jesus and his friends and all other beings on earth and beyond. Let the Spirit guide you, show you truth, and bring us together as we wait and work for the world to come. Amen.